Praise the Lord. Well, I want to uh, open this little part with a word of prayer, if I might. Can you hear me okay? Good. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for who you are and for who you've made us in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. And we are seated in heavenly places in Christ right now. Thank you, Lord, for every good message that has been ministered here yes, through your people. Yes, A people who is truly seeking you, God. We are seeking you. We ask you to continue to speak to us and even continue to unfold those messages that have been given to reveal all that your spirit would say to us, God. Thank you, Father, for using us for your glory. We are so pleased to be the beneficiaries of who you are. Thank you, God. We love you today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Sister Susie yeah. mentioned um, that was such a good message by the way thank you so much for that uh, she mentioned the phrase or something like you know we want to hear what the spirit is saying to the churches didn't she which comes from Revelation chapters 2 and 3 when the Lord himself was giving a report card, I say, of the seven churches of Asia. And to each one of them, he said, listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. You with ears, listen to what the Spirit is saying. And that's what this group is all about. There's no doubt in my mind. Anyway, the Lord gave me, uh, he sent me to uh, South America for six weeks uh, to seek his face. Uh, we lived there for a long time. We've been in a lot of places in the world, but he sent me there to seek his face, to write some messages. One of those messages, we published about 22 or 3,000 copies. We give them out freely. We've given 12 or 13,000. We may have 10,000 left. He told me just to put on there a word from the Spirit of the Lord to the churches because it is. Now, there are many words the Spirit of the Lord gives us. He gives us one every morning, every Sunday morning, every whenever we meet. He's, he's ready to if we're willing to listen. But how many of you know that we're not always ready to hear what the Spirit really wants to say? I mean, I know that. I know He stirs me as much as anyone else when I preach or teach or minister the Word wherever He has me do that. It's just as convicting to me. Never has not been. And, uh, but it's not always easy. I just have a copy here, but if you'd like one, you can just ask and we'll mail you one. We still send them everywhere. Praise the Lord. Um, how many of you believe in the fivefold ministry? Amen. Amen. Thank God for that and the revelation of that. How many believe that the gift of the prophet is a part of the fivefold ministry? Praise God. How many of you are willing to receive from that gift? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, God has sent you one. And there may be others here who are. But you know why he sends that gift? Because he loves us so much. That's why. He loves us so much. And to the churches, the seven churches of Asia, he said, those I love, I call to repentance. Those I love, I call to repentance. So I stand at the door and knock. He's outside. He's knocking. He calls to repentance those he loves. So he loves us. The Holy Spirit sends Debbie and I around the world, really, and for the last several years throughout America, and he sent us to St. Joe, Missouri, and he sent us to Pastor Larry and Sister Nancy's church, his church that he planted through them. And immediately we knew the Spirit of the Lord was there and at work. And immediately we knew they were authentic. And I've been in countless churches in many countries for many years. And I knew they were authentic, and we bore witness with that. And we said, praise God. 
Now, they don't get everything right, but I sure don't either. None of us do, but they are authentic, I think. And so I think, uh, so, so in everyone I've met in this circle uh, that, that we've met, we bear witness with this is an authentic work of God. And I've spoken at many large pastor's conferences with lots of people in this country and other places. It's not because I'm a great speaker. It's just because I'm available and it's my gift and call. That's, that's why I'm available to God and it's my gift and call. But uh, not all churches resonate the Spirit at all. And you know that. Not all Spirit-filled churches resonate the Spirit. And so uh, God wants us to resonate His Spirit. Amen. And I sensed that there. And I'm not saying that to flatter them because it's the Lord. Uh, it's just the Lord. But I'm thankful for it and so I'm thankful to be here today. Um, I have so much to say, but I'm just going to condense it as, as well as I can by the Spirit. The, uh, <clears throat> I didn't plan to say this. It's coming to my heart. You remember when David sent for the Ark of the Covenant to be brought back. And he didn't bring it back with the priests and the poles on the shoulders of the priests as he should have. And he was well-meaning. He was very sincere about the purpose for bringing the ark back. And his heart was right in his objective, but his methodology was wrong, right? And so God killed a man because he sincerely reached out to save the ark from hitting the ground. No doubt about his sincerity. That didn't mean the man died and went to hell. I don't believe so at all. It just meant he died because we couldn't touch the presence of God with a natural man's hands. It had to be God's way. <clears throat> The whole church, as we know it, for the most part, spirit-filled churches included, is being carried by men. Come on. Come on. And Mark, Mark carries it as a man many times. So remember, what I'm sharing is not to disparage anything that God is doing or has done in your midst. Right. Or in ours. You know, it's, it's as if we're looking across the, the mountain out here, these beautiful mountains I was sharing with someone before the service. Boy, it's a good thing there's not a picture window in here. The pastor could never keep anybody's attention. <laughs> it's beautiful. Well, you see, a prophet has a gift to see things that other gifts don't have to see. A teacher has an ability to teach. There are different kinds of teachers. He just has a natural ability. And we've heard some here, praise the Lord. A pastor has a natural unction for all that involves. And, uh, but the prophet's word sometimes seems so hard, so much that, that you know, we think, oh, no, no, no. But I'm telling you what I have seen for many years by the Spirit of God. That's all I'm doing. I'm describing the landscape. If I describe this, I say, well, there are beautiful mountains over there. And a couple hours ago, you know, the clouds were below the mountains and I would talk all about it. I'm just, so what I'm doing with you in a spirit of humility, but as a gift of a prophet, I'm sharing with you the landscape. And as you see yourself in that landscape, either mentally, emotionally, physically, however you may see yourself in that landscape, let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Yes. The edification of the body is not to edify for feeling better. It is to edify into the image of Jesus Christ. Yes. And to be edified into His image takes some chiseling, fire, Yes. Division of the heart, troubling in the spirit, man. It requires it. And uh, of course, uh, the gift of the prophet is the least one heard today. There are lots of prophets, lots of spiritism. But as there was under the old covenant, by comparison to the number of true, there are very few. 
It's just a gift from God. And uh, so I want to encourage you to let me share with you without feeling a personal, anything personal. Let me share with you the landscape. Just a little picture. Okay. Turn with me to Luke chapter 1, will you? I... <clears throat> just going to wade through this as the Holy Spirit helps me. Luke chapter 1, we're not just going to read a few verses here. Remember Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. So when John the Baptist was born, Zacharias prophesied after he was circumcised. <clears throat> Look with me beginning in verse 67. Now his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Can you say hallelujah? And has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets who have been since the world began that we should be saved from our enemies from the hand of all who hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers to remember his holy covenant the oath which he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives and now let me say there's no doubt in my mind in my natural mind I don't know Every man's heart, the Spirit hadn't showed me that, but there's no doubt in my mind that's exactly who we are in this room. I don't say that to flatter you. I really believe you are, just as I am. We seek to serve God as He wants to be served, don't you? Amen. So that's who we are. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare His ways, to give knowledge of salvation to His people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of God, and so on. You see, the Jews at the time, you remember, and I'm not going to take a lot of time to do this because I really want to get to the thrust of the message, and this, this just introduces the message. But at the time, the Jews were oppressed, as it were, under the Romans. And they wanted out from under them. They wanted their own freedom. They wanted uh, this Messiah that would come to rule as king, to usurp authority over Rome, or to deliver them from the power of Rome, because they were going by a prophecy that would come, but was not yet. Right. Now, Zechariah prophesied correctly. This was by the Spirit. And he was prophesying of the beginning and the end, both of the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Elijah, who was John the Baptist, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and the very end in the millennial reign when God would give them authority in the earth. And he's going to give all of his tremendous authority in the earth, whom he will. But all they saw, all they got out of that was verses 70 and 71. He spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets who have been since the world began that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of those who hate us. And verse 74, to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without, uh, with, in fear. Uh, without fear. In other words, they wanted to be out from under Rome but they wanted to do their own thing. They didn't, they, did not, uh, they didn't have God's agenda in mind, although they may have thought they did. Their hearts were hardened because of sin, because of self-righteousness, many things. And they wanted to rule, and they couldn't understand, okay, if you're the Messiah, it's time for you to take over as king, and we're supposed to rule this thing now. And so they couldn't accept him. I'm just going to run real quickly in my mind to John chapter 8, where when Jesus was preaching to some scribes and Pharisees, some believed on him, the word says. And then he says, I'll just read it real quickly. We'll take just a minute to do it. Turn to John chapter 8, will you please? Verse 30, as he spoke these words, many believed in him. And then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in me, you're my disciples indeed, 
and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? And Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. In essence, what Jesus is saying here and what he said the whole time of his ministry here, <clears throat> he came the first time to deliver us from ourselves. He wants to be king of us. And hopefully we are pressing in toward that. As I've told others, you know, Debbie and I stumble, but at least we're stumbling forward by the grace of God. Praise God. He wants to be king of us. That's what he came for the first time. But you see, in America, we are spoiled, as I've told my grandchildren. You know, as it relates to Christianity, it's like we've been raised in a candy shop. Candyland Christianity. And it's shallow. Now remember, this is not to be a personal offense to anyone as the Spirit of the Lord is at work. But listen, the cross is an offense to the flesh or it's no good. The truth is a sword to cut and divide and to show us what we need to see. But we live in a world of Candyland Christianity. And I said it'd be just like if your father and your grandfather and his grandfather were raised in Candyland Christian. If you were raised in a candy shop and you lived in those four walls and your father did and your father did, you don't have an understanding of reality. And, and Christianity in America is so shallow and there are many reasons for that. <clears throat> but as Americans, we desire the same thing. American Christians. We want the government off our back or either in line with us so we can do our thing. But we really don't know what it is to serve Jesus as the King. We really don't know it. We sing about it and we're sincere about it. We pray about it we're sincere about it. We read about it. We're sincere about it. But we just don't know it yet. And until we let God do major surgery, we will not know it. And what God has determined is that He's going to do major surgery whether we like it or not because He loves us. And first and foremost, He loves His name. And His name is in us. So God's going to do it. <clears throat> he came to deliver us from ourselves. Yeah. And when we're totally delivered from ourselves, we will be that keg of dynamite, won't we? Yeah. See, that's where the obstruction is. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. I forgot my next thought, but let's move on. <clears throat> You know, the times in which we live are critical, are they not? Yes, they are. I read last night, and I'm not a news junkie, but I read last night that yesterday Congress was warned that North Korea could easily uh, cause, uh, send a nuclear bomb above the USA with an EMP attack and destroy the whole electrical grid in for an indefinite period of time and kill 90% of Americans within a year. I mean, this was presented to Congress as a reality of what we're facing. <clears throat> now, I don't believe that's going to happen prophetically in my spirit. I don't believe that because he showed me other things, but I'm not the only one that speaks a prophetic word. He may have shown you other things, but I don't believe that's going to happen. But that is the time in which we live. <clears throat> I do know this. When I was in Argentina on a particular <clears throat> occasion, a few months before 9-11, I was sitting at the kitchen table of some dear Christian friends. We were just sitting there in the apartment sharing the things of God, and he gave me an open vision of 9-11. And he explained it to me. He didn't tell me the enemy of the United States would be Muslim, but he did explain to me. He said, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen in your country. 
It's going to be divided right down the middle. There's going to be a great divide in the country, particularly how to deal with this enemy. And eventually the majority are going to give in. That's how it's going to happen. You see, let me just explain to you now. God's going to bring the church, the body of Christ, His kingdom rule, to American believers who humble themselves before Him. You see, we have a choice. We can humble ourselves before Him now, or we can thank you, brother, or we can let Him humble us. And He is going to do that. So when you hear words of destruction is from God, it's not for evil, it's for good. He destroys the mark in me for good, for my good and for His glory. I'm just going to tell you, America's never going to be great again. We're in just a, we're just in just a little bitty moment of a little bitty moment of mercy. I agree. But the body of Christ is going to be glorious yes. more than it ever has been. Yes. But it, it'll only come through a broken body. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so praise God. I'm glad you agree with me. Praise the Lord. So when he showed me the 9-11 and what would happen and what would happen in the country, and I won't go through all that because I don't want to miss the thrust of the message. When he showed me that, he also gave me a vision of California and a large area in California, just black, just black. And I knew, all I knew about it was, was that it would be so great that it would have, have be a critical part of shaking the nation. I didn't know if it was a nuclear bomb or what. I also realized that at the time that that happened, the nation would either collapse or it would soon after. Now, I don't know if you're aware of the fires going on out in California now or not, but they're pretty much out of control as of last night. I'm glad to see the headlines. Now, that may not be what the Holy Spirit was showing me. I don't know. But it's getting pretty black out there. I hope that's all it was. And let me express something from a prophetic standpoint, a prophet's view, to help set things in equilibrium of our understanding. 9-11, it's, it's okay to say it was the judgment of God, to born, but it really wasn't the judgment of God, it was the mercy of God. So was Katrina. When we see the judgment of God, everyone will know it. All we've seen is the mercy of God. We're about to see judgment. But for the body of Christ, we're about to see glory. Remember, judgment for the body is for purification and cleansing so that we can multiply its glory. Judgment for the world is condemning. But for us, it's not who are in Jesus Christ. If we just keep our eyes on Jesus, yes. He's going to build a body. You know, the Holy Spirit just opened up television for us. Amazing, paid for it all and everything. Nationwide, coast to coast, Saturday night, prime time for a year. And I shared these things about believers. Believer, please understand there is a great difference between the kingdom of the United States and the kingdom of God. Amen. Thank God for the United States, although it's full of its own godly sins. Right. Thank God for your mercy and what you've established here, but it is not the kingdom of God. And the, the, the church of America, the kingdom of God people in America, for the most part, are hanging on the coattails of America like we're supposed to be hanging on the coattail of Jesus. Amen. So when, the, when the, the America loses its coat, when it falls off, when that blessed colored Joseph's coat falls off America, that favor God's given, 
We're going to be holding to a rag. We're going to have to find Jesus. Yes. Come on. So we can look for him now or we can wait. But it is coming. Yes. And it's coming for our good and for his glory. Right. Can you say praise God? Praise Amen. So I don't know if these fires in California have anything to do with that or not, but take it as you will. Right. Now the rest of the message, or that's kind of an introduction, is it's more difficult to swallow, but just somebody was praying, this sister or Pastor Larry, somebody was saying a little while ago, Lord, give me ears, to, give me an anointing to hear. That's what I want. Praise God for that. Give me ears to hear. Because our hearts get hardened and our eyes get blind and our ears get stopped up all while we're worshiping God. Yep. Sincere, loving Jesus sitting on the throne with Him. But see, we can be stopped up and we can't see, we can't hear, we can't move. So, so give me your ear now. Give the Lord your ear, please. I'm going to just read these scriptures. If you don't mind, I printed them out so it'd be, we could flow more quickly, but I'll give you Matthew chapter 8. You're familiar with all of these. First, I'm going to read them. I'll go ahead and give you the title of the message is Beware of the Leaven. Can you say that with me? Beware of the Leaven. Say it again, will you, brothers? Beware of the Leaven. We're going to talk about, uh, by the Spirit, a little bit of the leaven that we need to be aware of in our time. But I want to read these scriptures to set the stage. Matthew 8, 18 through 22. When Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. Then a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. That didn't exactly fit the scribe's lifestyle, did it? No. Let's run to the next one, Matthew 11, 7 through 8. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with a wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. First Corinthians chapter 4, verses 18 through 14. This is not a compliment to Corinth. It's a warning to Corinth. He says, Corinth, you're already full. You're already rich! Exclamation point. You've reigned as kings without us, and indeed I could wish you did reign, that we might reign with you. For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last, as men condemned to death. For we've been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We're fools for Christ's sake. Oh, but you're wise in Christ. They were not wise in Christ, but he was, he was making the point. They thought they were. He says, we're weak, but you're strong. We're poorly clothed. He says, you're distinguished, but we're dishonored. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst. We're poorly clothed, beaten, and homeless. Yes. After Jesus, after Pentecost. Mm -hmm. We labor working with our hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We've been made as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things until this very moment. He says, and I do not write these things to shame you, but as beloved children to warn you. He loved them. God loves His church. But God is God. He's like this. He ain't budging. And He's trying to bring us to Himself. He's trying to make us able to come to Himself so He can flow through us fully to the world. And we're dealing with a thimble and we're thrilled with it. Oh, God, have mercy. Come on. That's good. So I was at a pastor's conference in Chile. <clears throat> one, many, but one time. 
and we were praying before the conference and I was just, we were all praying pastors in this room around banquet tables and, and the Holy Spirit gave me a very vivid vision there and uh, I saw this great ballroom, just as clear I can see it right now, great ballroom. Big, big chandelier lights, high ceilings, men in tuxedos, women in beautiful ballroom gowns, and they were all dancing. And the tune was so beautiful, and the light was so beautiful. There was a big door on the right side of the room, a big door. And under the door, by comparison Jesus was on the other side of the door he said my people are dancing in their own ballroom what does he tell the church at Laodicea I stand at the door and knock if anyone will open the door I will come in to him I want to temper this in love because it's a word of love. Did you know it was such a wonderful revelation to me years ago when the Holy Spirit made clear to me I was preaching it in love anyway but he had me proclaim this loudly and I want to tell you repentance is a love word. It's not a hate word. That's right, right. It's a love word. God says, turn around. You're going the wrong way. There's a cliff over there. How many times do you hear the word repent preached nowadays? There is no love without preaching the love word repentance. I don't love my children if I'm going to let them run in the street. Praise the Lord. Be aware of the leaven. Now let's look at our main text. Praise God, Matthew chapter 16. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. I'm sorry, we're going to look at the Mark reference. There are two references, Matthew and Mark. Let's look at the Mark reference. <laughs> really doesn't matter. They're almost identical. We'll begin with verse 13. It's a real easy message to understand. The Holy Spirit is so good. If it were not, I couldn't preach it, that's for sure. Now here in this message, the Lord is telling us a lot of things. You know, every time the Lord spoke, He was telling us a lot of things. The Holy Spirit is the revealer of the Word. Isn't he? he mines out of the Word things that we just can't see on the surface. I mean, you know, some things you can kind of grasp, but He just keeps mining out of the Word. And I'm just amazed at the things I see him just mine out of the Word, not only in me, but in others. All, all the body of Christ, he's just showing us. In this parable, he, he, I was reading this parable one day, just meditating quietly in a room in our house years ago. And he said, stop right there. I'm going to show you something. Mind out of the Word. And right here, he's telling us how his kingdom is built under the new covenant right now in this hour, okay? He's telling us how to do it, and he's telling us how not to do it. Now, first, it's pretty obvious, and we look at it, we'll begin with verse 13. What chapter? I'm sorry, Mark chapter 8, verse 13. Jesus had just left the Pharisees, 
We'll back up to verse 11 and come into it. Then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. But he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be to this generation. Now verse 13 is where we start. And he left them and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. And they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. And Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you yet not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves and the five thousand? How many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said to him, Twelve. Also when I broke the seven for the four thousand, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said, Seven. So he said to them, How is it that you do not understand? Now it's pretty obvious what he's saying there, just right off the bat. And that is that, don't be worried about not having bread. I mean, if I was talking about bread, we could have bread in a minute and bread left over, right? But the Matthew 16 account shows very clearly what is the spiritual significance and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. And he's speaking, he says in Matthew chapter 16, they knew that he was talking about the doctrines of the Pharisees and of Herod, the influence the government's influence and the Pharisees, the religious influence, beware of it. Why beware? Because it's nothing but air. It's like leaven. You know, when you put leaven in bread, it rises, doesn't it? It's warm a little bit and rises and you cook it and it rises some more and it cooks. But it doesn't add substance. It doesn't multiply anything. It just gets larger. Most of the ministries that I've seen, I'm not blind, I, I say this by the Spirit, most of the ministries I've seen in America, not only here, but in every place where Christianity is free to roam because the influence is everywhere, are getting larger. I mean, many are getting larger, but there's no real substance. I think it was Brother Doc last night remembered, uh, said something about, you know, they have no root in them. They're, but there's no substance. But at any rate, you know, Jesus had seven woes for the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23. And one of those, he said, you know, you go about land and sea proselytizing and you multiply, you get all these young men, but you make them twice the sons of hell that you are. Because you're blind leaders of the blind. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. The influence, the subtle influence. So how does he multiply in the kingdom? He doesn't multiply by leaven and multiplication. He used a parable of the leaven in one of the parables of Matthew chapter 13 to speak of growth. But that wasn't what he was talking about multiplying. How did Jesus multiply? How are we to multiply His kingdom? How did He multiply the bread? By breaking it. He broke the bread and multiplied it. God's called us, if we are going to multiply sons and daughters to God, Mark has to be broken. Tom, Paul, Bruce, Susie, Sarah has to be broke. You cannot multiply to God with leaven. You have to be broken because it's a miracle work of God. Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke, I think it's chapter 21, He said, this is my body that is broken for you. Jesus was broken for us. We could go on and on about that. Matthew 21, 44, he said, 
the cornerstone. I'm the cornerstone that the builders rejected. And those that the stone falls on, it crushes. But if you fall on the stone, you're broken. See, we've, we've not fallen on a stone of Jesus in a long time. Come on, brother. God help us. See, now when God says that, He's not just saying, You rotten, sorry, nobody. He's saying, Fall on the stone. Yes, he That's how God multiplies. We've got to be broken. That's it. So you see the contrast in the scriptures I was reading to you about reigning as kings, the church of Corinth. Oh, you reign as kings and we suffer. We're giving our lives up daily. I wish you did reign as kings. Maybe you could rescue us. But you don't really reign as kings. You say you're wise and you're not. Mm -hmm. but. Same thing as the church at Laodicea. Yeah. You're blind as a bat. But I love you. I'm knocking on the door. So the scribes and Pharisees multiplied by adding leaven. Made larger, nothing but air, no substance. Jesus multiplies by being broken. We multiply His kingdom work as we are broken. Humbled. Humble ourselves. Continually. <clears throat> Matthew 21, 44 through 46. I'll just read this quickly. Whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. You remember how long it had been since they had heard a prophet? 400 years. Except for John the Baptist. What'd they do to him? They threw him in prison and cut his head off. What'd they do to Jesus? They crucified him. All the time he was weeping over them, they crucified him. After 400 years, they said, we perceive that he's a prophet. Let's kill him. Can I tell you how many places I've been? And they've said, he's a prophet. Get him out of here. I cannot. There are too many. All while weeping over the church. You see, the true prophet loves the church. If he's representing God... So it had been 400 years since they heard a prophet. How long has it been since you've heard one? How long has it been since the larger church body has heard one? They wasn't reigning as a king. Didn't think he was all wise. Not walking with his chest out on some big platform. But a prophet in the wilderness. See, the church has gone a long time without it. We'll close as I break down this, these baskets as the Holy Spirit said now, you know, in, in verse uh, 21, Jesus said, so He said to them, how is it that you still do not understand? And the Holy Spirit said, be still, I'm going to show you. There were two occasions that we know of where Jesus fed the multitude. Where he broke the bread, it multiplied. And he fed them. The first time, he had five loaves. There were 5,000 people. There were two fishes. And how many baskets full left? The five loaves that were fed to the 5,000 represent the law. Five represents the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The 5,000 
represent the people of the law of the Old Covenant. The first one is a picture of the Old Covenant. God gave the law to the people of the law. There were two fishes. Fish were alive. They were killed to be fed. The fish represent the law and the prophets, Moses and Elijah, and all of those who truly spoke the word of the Lord, who gave their lives speaking the word of the Lord. You know how you kill a fish? I did a lot of fishing growing up. You hit him on the head with a mallet. Mm -hmm. You know how they killed Jesus? Right hand, left hand, foot. You know how they killed the prophets? Whatever horrible way they could think of. So the fish represent the lives of those that gave themselves for the multitudes, the children of Israel, the people of the law. The 12 baskets, what number, what, what does 12 represent in the scripture? Often the government of God, people of God. There were 12 sons, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles. All of that is a picture of what was produced in the old covenant, in the new covenant. The bread was taken, it was broken. How many loaves were there? The next time Jesus fed, he asked the disciples, he told them, seven. What does the number seven represent? Perfection, completion. Jesus was broken. How many fishes? A few. No certain number, a few representing all of those of us who would give our lives for His namesake. That doesn't mean you'd necessarily be martyred, but it means you... Listen, it's harder to live your life dead than it is die your life dead. Mm -hmm. As we give our lives for it. Many will go in the wide gate, but few will find it. Right. The narrow way. So that's how he's multiplying. How many baskets full were left? Seven. And he said, full baskets. What does the seven represent again? The many who were made righteous through the brokenness of Jesus and those lives who were given, broken also, and died to self, to multiply sons and daughters. Jesus said, except a corn, grain of corn fall in the ground and die, it cannot multiply. Right. I got to die, then I'm going to lead you in death. His, his work on the cross was not to deliver us from the cross. It was to deliver us from the condemnation that sin brought against us and ultimate eternal perishing because of sin. Yes. But He guides every one of us to the cross. Thank you, Father. Mm -hmm. Let's look in Luke chapter 9 now if we can, please. We'll close with this. Praise the Lord. Sorry, yeah, okay, I just couldn't find my verse there for a second. Verse 23 and following, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And you know the rest of it. That's how we multiply in the kingdom. 
only way. We can get really large doing lots of things. Mm -hmm. Sounding good and sincere. Well, yeah. Come on, brother. The problem is we sound so good to ourselves and we look so sincere to ourselves. Come on. And people are coming because we put on a whatever. No. God help us. And there are a thousand different ways to do that. You know, the Holy Spirit gave me a word uh, well, this particular one many years ago and said, it was around the end of the 90s, somewhere in South America I was preaching. and He said, I'm going to let my church, my people, exhaust themselves of themselves. Then I'm going to rescue them. But until they exhaust themselves of themselves, I mean every breath, until you get totally tired of yourself, I am not going to intervene. Because he had put it in my heart, the Spirit had nothing I'd read or seen, all of that's fine and good and well, but the Spirit speaks. That's who I want to hear, it's who I listen to. He spoke to my heart a lot of things, and one of them was about this glorious church and the perfection of the bride, the readiness of the bride, the fullness of Christ in the local body. Let me tell you, the kingdom of God is the big picture. And of, of course, it's the kingdom of God, truth, and life that is the big picture. The heartbeat of it is the local church. The fullness of Christ manifested purely comes out of the local church where each one coming together with a measure of Christ's gift reconstitute, if you will, the full measure of Christ and through time and experience patiently grow together into the maturity of Christ. That's when the kingdom of God is going to be seen the greatest. You see, we're impressed with rich men. I've known men probably as rich as you, nearly billionaires, a few. Well, we're impressed with rich men. Jesus wasn't. What did he tell the man, the young man we call a rich young ruler? Apparently, we believe he's the only one Jesus ever told that to. He didn't say, okay, now take your money now. We're going to go build it. Listen, I'm not accusing you. I'm talking to me. It's the whole thing. We're going to go build a nice building and a big platform. That doesn't mean he doesn't want us to build a nice building and a platform. Understand. But that's not the answer. Right. Mm -hmm. It may call for that to accommodate what God's doing through brokenness. Through death to self so his life can flow through us. But he didn't say, look, you got the money, let's do a big Christian concert, let's do a big thing, let's do a big thing, and multiply. Sell all you have, give it to the poor, come follow me. Can't do that. You know, we're crazy about the Ten Commandments in Christianity in America, elementary Christianity in America, thousand miles wide, a half inch deep. <clears throat> the thought escaped me what I was going to say. But God wants us to grow up. He loves us. Yes, he, he loves us. But we are so far removed. Mm. We're so far removed. There is so much leaven in today's hour. Much of it has to do, the focus, much of it has to do with wealth and riches. I know what I was going to say. There are Ten Commandments. You know, we're crazy about them. We post them and everything, and all that's good and well and fine. And praise God for standing up for truth in America. And I, I vote, and I praise God, and I pray for the country and all that. I just understand there's a difference between the American kingdom and the kingdom of God. Mm 
And I keep the two separate as long as I'm influencing the world around me, as God would have me to. But you know, <clears throat> let's consider some new commandments in America. What about the commandments Jesus gave? Mm -hmm. Store up not for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break through and steal, but store up your treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt and thieves do not break through and steal. Amen. It's a whole nother message of the Spirit. The church in America is so tied to that godless money system. So the Holy Spirit spoke to me in the late 90s and he said, I'm going to break it. When he jerks that dollar out of the way, the church is going to run for the hills. We ministered all over to Argentina as, as a part of our South American ministry and the Holy Spirit spoke to me six months before the banks went broke, before it was the news, and I prophesied the banks were going broke. The Holy Spirit had me speak several things. After the banks went broke, we went back. Debbie went with me, one or two of our daughters, and went to South Argentina, Rio Galleros, and had a large pastor's conference for the pastors of the Patagonia, hundreds of there, maybe a thousand, many pastors there and preaching. And God gave me Jeremiah 23. And, but I, the, the word I want to say is, what happened after the, the peso crashed in 2000, what happened was the church split in half. According to their own records, at least 50% of the people left. That's where we are in America. So I just leave you with this word. Every dollar you have in the bank is going to be sucked out like a vacuum cleaner. Because God wants to be our God. And He loves us. But above that, He loves His name. And He entrusted it to us. His name is not in the trees. It's not in the cars. It's not in beautiful mountains. Although we see His glory, His name is in us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In Ezekiel 36, He told the children of Israel, He said, listen, I put my name in you and you've wandered here, there, and yonder instead of staying in the own place I've given you, the place that I've designated for you, and you've made a shame of my name. He said, I'm ashamed for my name. And he said, not for your sakes, not for your sakes, but for my sake, I'm going to wash you with clean water and I'm going to fill you with my spirit. Lord. Lord. Same thing for us. Brother Larry, this is the last thing I want to say. Psalm 85, 9. It's a powerful little verse. Years ago, the Spirit gave it to me with a little bit of light. The salvation of God has come near those who fear Him that His glory may fill the land. Mm -hmm. And God has three priorities. Three. The first one is to glorify Himself. The second one is to glorify Himself. Mm -hmm. The third one is to glorify Himself. So we gotta we gotta trade in our glory. We gotta trade in the strength of our right arm. We gotta totally vacate most everything we've believed in. We've gotta be broken. This is the age, this this part of the church age is an age of brokenness, of humility, not defeat. Brokenness. That's where the victory is. The victory was in the cross. Yes. Yes. Paul told the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15 or 16, he said, you're foolish to think you can rise from the dead if you hadn't died. You've got to die first. Come on. Die first. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you, Lord, for showing me a few new friends that love you and love your truth. And 
Father, help us as we try to digest truth so that it will do us some good. And I just pray, God, that you would take uh, these words and translate them by your Spirit for each one here, including me, and that the sound would go forth loudly. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.